and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good morning. I'd like to welcome those who are watching this TV program this morning to stay with us and be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible says that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You take your Bibles and open up to Hebrews chapter 12 with me, please. One, two, and three. Verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1, two, and three. In the Old Testament, Jesus made a promise to Abraham that through his seed all nations would be blessed. That seed was talking about the coming of the Messiah in their day, the coming of the anointed one, the Christ. And when Jesus came, that promise was fulfilled to all those that lived righteously in the Old Testament, okay? But they didn't get to go to heaven. Until Jesus died. Okay? And then they and us together, those on this side of the cross in the New Testament, did not get to enjoy of going to heaven without each other. Okay? The cross is the center of history. And it was that from the Old Testament and then from the New Testament that salvation was met. The joy of going to be with Jesus was met at that time. Now, those in the Old Testament that lived and died in the faith, when Jesus died and resurrected from the dead, went to heaven, okay, to be with the Lord. And we find the account of that in Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verse 1. The Hebrew writer said, Wherefore, Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. When you read Hebrews chapter 11, you can find many that lived and died in the faith that calls them by name, that went to heaven to be with the Lord. But these are people that have witnessed the promise, okay? These are people that some have witnessed the Christ when he lived on the earth. But there are those that witnessed that Jesus went back to heaven like the apostles. But we have so great a cloud of witnesses. See? Those who are rooting for us, okay? Now they can't see us in heaven. You know, God made a promise that those that go to be with him in heaven there'll be no more sorrow, no more tears. One more thing to be passed away. If they could look down on this earth today and see the loved ones who aren't come to Christ, they wouldn't be very happy people, okay? They'd be shedding tears. But there are people who held on to the promise all their ages, through the generations, and went to be with the Lord. Okay, we have a cloud of witnesses. And then, we are to lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us. That's talking to Christians, okay? Yes, Christians do sin. The church does sin. You know, we need to make that known because there are those who are out there teaching, even in the brotherhood, that there's sinless perfection. Once you're your sins are washed away by the blood of Christ, you can't sin anymore. There's no more corruption. Okay? But the Bible doesn't teach that. And I'll tell you, there's many scriptures that a person can stand on to uh, prove it. But we're to lay aside every weight in the sin which was so easily beset us. And let's not get too far away. Let's think about last week. All of us. Okay? Can you count the number of times 
that you were upset or you were deterred away from serving God or keeping the right attitude that God would want you to have or doing the right thing. Yeah, we can count them, can't we? Yeah, they're there. And that's what the Hebrew writer is saying. Let us lay aside every weight. What caused that to happen? Okay, now we can all think about it in our different situations. Now what brought that to happen? And then, you know, when you go to the root of the problem, and the Bible says, lay it aside or move it out of the way. Okay? Once that happens, it should never happen again in the same way. Okay? We should get a little bit more grip on it. In other words, if it first happens, we have the ability to move it out of the way a little bit. If it happens again, guess what? Our ability should be even greater. And then even greater. And guess what? One day, we will have asked God's wisdom from above. We'll be able to move it completely aside out of the way. That's what Hebrew writers say. Now, each of us might say, well, they, you know, everybody else don't have the problem I do. Well, that's true. Okay, we each have different problems. But they're as equally as hard on the individual as is for you. Okay? God's saying it's not impossible to lay these weights aside. And the sin, which this so easily beset us. These weights, if we allow them, will cause us to sin. Okay? In other words, it will cause us not to do what God said. And that's what sin is, simply breaking God's commandments, you know, uh, transgressing God, what God says, that's what sin is. And we have to label one particular sin. And that's what these weights do, whatever it might be, that besets us. We're to move them aside. If we don't, it will cause us to sin. So, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Guess what? It's too late. If you've been burdened with Christ and Baptist, it's too late to say, I don't want to be in that race. Okay? In God's eyes, it's already been set in motion. You're in the race, okay? And I am in the race. And the Bible says that we are to run, let us run with patience. What is patience? Endurance. A word to endure. When we endure, guess what doesn't happen? We don't sin against God. Okay, when we endure. So, putting them together in, in verse 1, if we don't move the weight aside that besets us, it causes us to sin. Okay? But when we move those weights aside, we endure. Okay? We don't sin. We endure. And we're in a race. We're going to run this race with endurance. That is set before us. Okay? There's not two races. There's not three races. There's not different kinds of races. There's only one race. And it's been set before each Christian. Okay? The same finish line, the same rules to the race, it's for everyone. And we must run this weight race with patience. Endurance. The race is set before us. How do we get that done? By looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, it doesn't simply mean, you know, you're looking up. When you pray, you ought to look up, okay? Now, if you want to talk to the Lord, what's the best way to talk to Him? You know, set your eyes to the direction that He's at. But also, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, is studying his word. Okay? That's what it means. Reading and studying his word is what is the way that we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. When we do that, when we start study God's word, we learn how to pray. Okay? Learn how to give thanks. We learn how to worship, okay, give him the praise the way he wants it. We learn how to give. We learn how to raise our children. Husbands and wives learn how to treat one another. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on. Simply by studying the Word of God. That's looking unto Jesus, the author 
the measure of our faith. No one else can nor knows how to instruct you when you're first born and then when you die. Okay? When you're first born and when you die. Only Jesus. Only Jesus can do that. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith, who for the joy was set before him, he had to endure. Okay, he had to endure. If Jesus had to endure, don't you think that we should we be too also? Yes. If Jesus had to endure, that means he could have seen it. He chose to. Okay? All he had to do is simply obey in any circumstances, not his father's will. Okay, if he chose not to obey. But he chose to, did he not? He chose to obey. Jesus could have sinned if he wanted to, but he chose to endure the cross. Now think of this, brothers, sisters. How would you like to be beat and spit upon and ridiculed? How would you like a crown of thorns to be put on your head and beat down into your skull? How would you like to be beaten with a whip until your bones are shown? How would you like to have nails uh, dry, grow through your hands and your feet to a tree and then laughed at? That's what Jesus endured. Do we have to endure anything like that? No. But yet, the Hebrew writer says, in, in verse verse 1, that we are to run with patience. That word patience means to endure. We are to endure. We're to endure, just like Jesus did. In verse 2 there, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You want to know one sure way to endure? And had the victory, had joy in your life because of Jesus. To have joy of knowing that you're going to heaven one day when you die or Jesus comes back. Okay? Now, the opposite of that is if you're a Christian and you don't, have, you don't know you're going to heaven, there can't be no joy there. Now, there are some people who don't consider it either way. They go on through their life living like a, the wave of the sea, tossed to and fro. Think, well, that's the way it is. Well, that's not true. God has an order of things. God has intelligence in all that He said and had done. Okay? And He has instructed us, He has given us the power in His Word to have intelligence in what we say and do. And you and I can do it. So we're to endure. If Jesus had to endure, we, we have to endure. And the way we can do that is, is have joy of knowing we're going to heaven. The question this morning for you and I, and for all God's people, wherever they might be in the world today, do you know you're going to heaven? Now, I mean, I know we say yes, but was you, did you, were you ever going on did you ha ever have joy you were on vacation and you felt good and you were getting some of the problems off your back beginning to see a new scenery and you know beginning to enjoy the sunshine when it rose in the morning and, and things of that nature and you're free from all that tied you down you got to enjoy yourself a little bit is that joy was that joy there when you were first born? Was it? When you first decided that I need a vacation, we need a vacation, whatever the case may be, that joy wasn't there. You could you kind of feel a little bit about it. You know, when that time comes, this will be great. Yeah. It's not there when you're planning it because you still got the, the problems on your back. You're still stuck here doing what you normally ordinary do. You still have the things that makes you nervous and upset you. Yeah, but 
But when we have joy of knowing we're going to heaven someday, not only do the people in church know it, but the people in the world know it. Okay? Not only do your brothers and sisters know it, but your mom and dad, your brother, your brothers and sisters, your kids, your grandma and grandpa, your aunts and uncles know it. Your boss know it, knows it. See? Because you have that hope of going to heaven. You set your mind and affection on going to heaven. You are planning on dying going to heaven. Okay? Yeah, I like to go to the Smoky Mountains or Alaska. You know, I, I want a vacation right now. Joanne and I both do. We just want to get away. We don't know when that's going to happen. If, 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 there's, if there's any light shines on it, you know, there's going to be a little bit of joy poking up there. All right, it's going to happen. You know, it ain't here yet, but it's going to happen. Well, that's where we ought to be with heaven. Or going to spend with Jesus every day of our life. And that's what the Hebrew writer is teaching us here. Jesus endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. Now, what was the joy set before him? You know? The world. He knew that he was the perfect sacrifice. Okay? He wouldn't be anymore. He was the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. Yes, he loved his Father in heaven so much that he was going to obey him until the end. He did. See, Jesus knew that he was going to die on the cross. He knew he was going to die that kind of death. And he lived with it for, for 30 years. Probably not that many. I think he probably didn't understand it when he was a little kid. But he lived with that. He knew that this moment was coming. He says, it was for this hour that I came into the world. The Bible says. He knew it. And he knew that this here, this here torture, this here way that he's going to die, not only was the way that God wanted him to die, but it's going to be for people who were his enemies. You see, before we ever were Christians, before we ever come to the Lord, we were his enemies. Separated from him. See, he still loved us enough to choose, okay? He wasn't made to do it like a lot of people like to keep. He chose to do it because of his love for the world. John 3.15, the Bible says that God stole Love the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That was the purpose. And that will be your and I's purpose this morning, okay? Our importance should not be put on the way, this way of life. Our importance ought to be put on the next life. We don't know when we're going to die. Okay? We don't know when we're going to die. Jesus going to come back. And what we're doing in this life isn't going to be important to us anymore when we're taking our last breath. But we need to be living that way every day. Okay? Because the joy was set before Jesus, that joy was the world. He knew. In John chapter 17, the Bible says, he knew that he was going back to be with his Father and enjoy the glory that he had with him and he also knew that those who took the opportunity to obey the gospel and live faithfully unto the end could be there with him. In John chapter 14, verse 1, the Bible says, You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. And that where I am, there you may be also. See, when he comes back, Jesus is going to take those who have been obedient to the gospel and have remained faithful unto the end back to the Father's house. Okay? That was the joy that he had set before him. Now you and I can endure also. And we have a joy. Like Jesus. Our joy is to realize that we're just children. 
have to do this life. Okay? This is not our home. We're not of the world. Jesus told in, in the book of John, they're not of the world because I'm not of the world. Okay? They live in the world, and he prayed the Father in heaven that he would protect us and leave them. Okay? But we're not of the world. Our home isn't here. When we get to be in the presence of the Almighty God and His throne, we're going to be home. We're going to be home. And that should bring joy to our hearts. That should bring joy to our hearts. And that's what will help you and me endure in this life. When we choose, okay? God doesn't make puppets out of it. He's going to make you do nothing. He leaves it to you and me to choose and decide to follow and do what He says. Okay? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set down before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured to the point that he got to sit down again with his Father on the throne. You and I are commanded by Jesus his word to endure until the end. Not a little while, not in some circumstances, but in everything until the end. But you and I will stand before Almighty God in his throne. Okay? Verse 3. Well, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your mind. We partake of the Lord's Supper to remember how Jesus endured for us. Okay? That's why we take the Lord's Supper. How much do we in, do we think on these things during the week? You know, you ask yourself the question. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And out of all that time, how much time did you give on thinking, remembering what Jesus said on the cross? Or do you just wait until Sunday morning, Sunday night, to come and try to get your mind in order to partake of the Lord's Supper? You see, the Hebrew writer says that we are to endure like Jesus did unto the end. And I'm telling you this morning, our remembering of what Jesus did on the cross, his death and burial and resurrection, should be from Monday to Sunday. It should never end. Okay? It never ends. And I tell you, there's joy in it. I love it. I love it. When I can sit down and open up my laptop and get into the Bible, I love it. And I can read and read and read and read and read and study. God blesses me. I understand things more. And I don't want anything else. Shut me off to myself. I'm perfectly satisfied. We need to have that kind of joy. In 1 Peter chapter 2. Starting with verse 19. Jesus' joy was so great, not for himself, but for the people of the world, okay? It was so great. He set an example all the way up until he took his last breath. He set an example. Verse 19, the Bible says, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. That's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? It is. It is hard to do sometimes. But I think it's easier for some people than others. And the reason I say that is because the more time you spend in God's Word, the more ability you have to do that. The less time you spend in God's Word, the less ability you have to do that. But what glory is it if we need buffet for yourself, your faults, okay, when we get in trouble for our faults? Ye shall take it patiently. He's asking questions. 
But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable to God. We read in Acts chapter 5, apostles were teaching in the name of Jesus. They got trouble for it, didn't they? Yeah, they got beat. We're going to try to put them in prison or, or something worse. But you know what their attitude was? They counted it all glory to be able to suffer for the name of Christ. They suffered shame for the name of Christ. They had joy in their hearts because they were beaten and got in trouble. So much that they went right back out and started doing it again. <laughs> okay? How many of us would do that? The authorities take us in and beat us and threaten us. We would go back out and just do it again. Yeah, they had joy. They endured unto the end. Well, we need to do the same thing. <clears throat> Verse 20. For what glory is it if when you're buffeted for your fault or for our fault, you shall take it patiently? Or you're, uh, should you endure it? We do wrong and then get in trouble for it. Should we endure that? No, we should not endure that. Because we're in the wrong. I remember Paul one saying one time, if I'm at fault, I'll take whatever punishment it's given me. If I'm not, I'm not deserving it. I'm not going to take it. That's the way we ought to be. See? That's one uh, valuable thing that if you know the law, law of the land, there might be some occasions that you can use the law to protect yourself. Verse 21, for even here in two were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, or endured for us, okay? Leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. That example continued on until he took his last breath, Okay? And we are to follow in his steps. My friend, enduring for the name of Christ should begin when you come up out of the waters of baptism until you take your last breath. That's what the Bible says. There's a rate set, set before us and we are to be endured. Went on to say in verse 22, Jesus, who did no sin, Neither was guile found in his mouth or deceit. Who, when he's reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Jesus chose not to do these things, by the way. Okay, he didn't have any extra power. Or, uh, God didn't make him a puppet. He chose. He decided not to do these things. Okay? Now, if anybody would have had a right to threaten, it would have been Jesus. But he was the son of the Almighty God. And look how the world was treating him. Yeah. If anybody had to make any threats, it would have been him. But he did not. I tell you, he was led to his dead like death like a sheep. He was sheared. He opened not his mouth. Okay? He didn't say a word. He didn't do anything to stop him. He endured it. He endured it until the end because he had a great joy with him. He committed himself to him that judges like him. God the Father. He committed himself. That he meant his total being, his life, his soul, to God the Father while he lived on the earth. Whatever happened to Jesus, he stayed committed to the one who is going to deliver him. My friends, we're taught the same thing. We must be committed to the same one Jesus committed himself to, God the Father, until the end. Because he is the only one that's going to deliver us. Okay, We're going to be delivered by the Almighty God to endure until the end. In verse 24, who is his own self? bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. 
Jesus, you don't see me. His eyes did not see flesh. But yet, he became sin. For you and me, he became sin. He did that. He buried sin, our sins on the, in his body on the tree. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says to the church of Corinth, Remember Jesus in the, the garden. He prayed, Father, not my will be done. done. He prayed, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. See, Jesus physically did not want to go through that death on the cross. The body was weak. The pain. He didn't want to. But his love for the Father caused him to endure, to obey. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, the Bible says, For he, speaking of God, has made him to be sin for us, speaking of Jesus, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus took our place on the cross. He paid the penalty for sin for us. So we couldn't do it. Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Jesus had a great joy to do that. If you were sinless, you never knew what sin was, you were perfect, would you want to take on sin? Would you want to become sin? You wouldn't. Absolutely not. Yeah. Jesus did. Because he chose to, because he loved the Father. And we that were in sin, you and I that practiced sin, because of his joy, his endurance on the cross, made it possible that you and I could be free from sin and be made the righteousness of God in Him. See, that's what endurance does. That's what has having joy of knowing we're going to heaven does. We're made the righteousness of God in Him. And we can live in this life as righteousness in God. Okay? No matter what anybody says. Colossians said in Colossians chapter 1, that we have been made fit. I think it's in verse 12, 13. We have been made fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life because of what Jesus did. We have been made fit right now. You and I are fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. Right now we are. Yes. Jesus took our place and made us the righteousness of God in him. Romans chapter 8. Paul's letter to the church at Rome. In verse 28. Romans 8, 28. Paul said to the church at Rome, he says, and we know, and he used the word we there, it meant plural. Okay? He's talking to someone or someone. Other people, right? And he said, and we know. Other words, when Paul spoke those words, he was saying that not only did he know, but everybody he was speaking to knew also. And what he was saying, when he knew and they knew, there was no doubt, okay? There was no, nothing there that would verify that what Paul was saying that these people weren't a part of it. He says, and we know. What about in the church today when that verse of Scripture is read? Can I say that? And we know? Oh, wait a minute. You mean I can read your mind and I actually know that you know? Does everybody in the church really know what Paul's talking about right here? Do with you, not. you see, I can't speak for you, can I? You can't speak for me, right? Because my relationship with God doesn't depend upon your relationship with God. When I go to the Father in prayer, it's because I go to the Father in prayer. 
cut you. And then you know the Father's prayer. It's like, likewise. It's an individual relationship with God. Covenant relationship with God. I don't have the power of the apostles today to do that. I can't read your mind. You can't read mine. Can anybody here tell me what I did uh, two days ago at a certain time? Can anybody here tell me what I'm thinking right now? Not in total hours. Neither can I ye. But when we read this verse of Scripture, Paul says to the church at Rome, and we know, to those whom he's talking to, we know. In other words, he can speak without lying, without a doubt, but they know just like he does. Now what it is that they need to know? That all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. The question is this morning, do we know that all things work out for the good? There are the two reasons. All good. To those who love God and call for the purpose. Let's not turn that around with it. If we are called according to this purpose and we do love God, then we are going to know that things are that we good. We've experienced it. We know. Okay? But on the other hand, if we don't love God and are not called according to His purpose, we're not going to know. Yeah. All in a nutshell, what did Jesus say in John? If you love me, you'll what? You'll keep my commands. Okay? If you love me, you'll keep my commands. And so, one of the qualifications for everything working out to the good for us individually and collectively, is first we have to love God. That means we have to keep His word. We have to do what He says. Keep His command. And then we have to be called according to His purpose, not ours. So again, we can each go look back last week and uh, when, when things arose in our life. How did we deal with them? Did we deal them with them how God sees it, or did we deal with them how we see it? We're called to do those things according to His purpose. Not our call to silence. Paul had the dream. The world of Macedonia began teaching. They were beat, cast into prison. Was that done because of them? Because of their purpose? No. It was done because of God. They loved God enough to go through that, okay? To finish it, to endure it. They had joy, and we can tell, because at midnight they began to sing praises and pray to God. And what happened? The end result was goodness. Goodness, the goodness of God came to God, did it not? Yeah, there were a family saved from their sins. There were people saved from their sins because of that. Yeah. We know that all things work for the good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. Romans chapter 12. Verse 1 and 2. It was God's purpose from the old to the new that his people would be delivered to worship him in freedom in the way that he wanted them to. Okay? Romans 12, 1, 2. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, 
which is the reasonable servant. You see, God don't want us to be a, a sacrifice like it was for Jesus. He wants us to be a living sacrifice. In other words, he wants us to sacrifice our wants in this lifetime. Okay? The Bible says, if you don't deny yourself and take up your cross, you cannot be my disciple. He wants us to deny our life in this world, our wants in this world, for the sake of the lost. Okay? Be a living sacrifice. It goes on to say there, that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. That's re reasonable with God, okay? You're going to ask, ask us to climb the highest mountain which people give millions of dollars for and uh, risk their lives for. He didn't ask us to swim the sea, the ocean. He didn't ask us to go to the moon. He didn't ask us to make all the money in the world. He just simply asked us to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's our job as a Christian, as a church. We're not to be conformed to this world. We're not to talk, see, watch TV, do things that the world does, and it affects us and makes us become part of it. God's family. We're not to be conformed to the world. We're to be transformed. If we can live in this world and not conform to the world, don't talk and act like the world, we're okay. Because we're transformed. Okay? We're transformed. Why? It starts right here. In the renewing of our mind. Where it begins, the battlegrounds right here, there's a great war taking place between God and Satan. And the battlegrounds right here. Who is going to win your mind? Is it God or Satan? Who's going to win? Who's going to win out? See, you have the choice. You have the decision to decide who controls your mind. Is it God or Satan? So we have the choice to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. When we do, when we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, we have the ability to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But when we're as Christians and we're conformed to the world, when we start acting like the world, start talking like the world, well, then we're clouded up, our mind's clouded up. And the ability there to prove that perfect, that good and perfect will of God is not there. No matter how hard you try. See, sometimes even in the church, sin gets a powerful hold on us. We need to repent. Simply need to repent. I believe today that the God is calling the church to repent. Because we know that we're coming to the church. We want to repent. We can do something to change the situation. This morning, if you're not a Christian, the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing that message, one repents of their sin. Repentance is a change of mind toward the way that you're living and you turn towards God. Then the Bible says one must be baptized by immersion to have your sins washed away and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, not to help you speak in tongues and do miracles, but to help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and his word unto the end. If you're a Christian this morning and you haven't been transformed but you're being conformed to the world, you're not living as close to God and his word as you need to be, I think you need to repent before it's too late. Repentance is simply a change of mind. 1 John 1, 9, the Bible made provision for that, for the Christian that we are to confess our sins to him, Jesus, who is just and faithful to forgive us 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You have a decision to make. Why don't you do that as we stand and sing?